You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Get cash for clothes at Plato's Closet in North Charleston and West Ashley. It's so easy. Recycle, earn cash, repeat. We pay cash on the spot for your trendy, gently used clothing, shoes, and accessories. At Plato's Closet, we buy all seasons, all day, every day. It's time to clean out your closet and cash in. Bring in your denim, graphic tees, athletic wear, shoes, handbags, and more. Sell your styles to Plato's Closet for cash. Then do it again. Plato's Closet, located in West Ashley on Sam Rittenberg Boulevard and North Charleston on Rivers Avenue. Hello, everyone, and welcome to History of the Second World War, Episode 143, The Winter War, Part 1, Nordic Defiance. This week, a big thank you goes out to Jason and Uli for the donations, and to Sergey. Eugene, Leonid, Justin, Soren, and Gavin for choosing to become members. You can find out more over at historyofthesecondworldwar.com slash members. Last episode covered the events that led up to and then immediately followed the signing of the mutual assistance pacts between the Soviet Union and three Baltic nations, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. One of the key pieces of those agreements was the provision that allowed the Soviet Union to place troops and aircraft within the boundaries of those nations, under the excuse that such actions were required to protect both the security of those nations and the security of the Soviet Union. This, however, had the effect of essentially removing those nations' independence because it negated any ability they may have had to defend themselves against Soviet aggression. There was another nation that the Soviet Union wanted to sign a similar agreement with, Finland. But Finland would react very differently to the Soviet advances. Instead of signing a mutual assistance agreement allowing the Soviet soldiers to enter Finland, Finnish leaders would instead decide to resist. And resist, they did. The resulting fighting would last almost three and a half months, and over that time the Finnish military would put up stout resistance, and the Red Army would encounter many problems as they attempted to put the Finnish army in its place. But in the end, the sheer size and power of the Red Army would make long-term resistance impossible, and a peace treaty would eventually be signed, with the Soviet Union clearly winning the conflict. That simple fact is worth keeping in mind over the next eight or so episodes, during which the podcast will cover what would come to be called the Winter War. Regardless of the smart moves made by Finnish leaders, the failures of the Red Army leadership, the unpreparedness of the Soviet military for war, or the remarkable individual bravery shown by Finnish soldiers, Finland would lose. In such a lopsided conflict, there was no path to a Finnish victory, although they gave it their best shot. This episode will discuss the political preludes to the conflict, including the negotiations that would take place during 1939 before the conflict started. Then, next episode, we will discuss the military preparations made by both sides, before episodes 3 through 8 will cover the conflict itself. But before we begin, there are a few ways that this conflict ties into the wider Second World War in Europe. Obviously, the Soviet military would learn lessons during the fighting, which would benefit it in 1941, Uh, but also caused some unique problems that we'll discuss in the last episode. The Finnish military would participate in the fighting on the Eastern Front after 1941 in collaboration with the Germans, partially because of the conflict that we're about to discuss made them hate the Soviet Union somehow even more. Britain and France would seriously consider sending assistance to Finland even if it meant starting a war with the Soviet Union. And finally, the performance of the Red Army against the tiny military of Finland would make the nation seem far weaker than previously thought, and would influence decision-making in 1941. All of that is in the future, though, and to begin discussing the Winter War, we should probably start with its most famous participant, Carl Gustav Mannerheim. Mannerheim had served in the Russian Imperial Army before the First World War, and had also been a member of the Tsar's court before that conflict. During the Great War, he had gone on to command first a cavalry division and then a cavalry corps, before being relieved of his command during the summer of 1917 by the new Social Democratic government that had been put in place after the First Russian Revolution. He was relieved due to concerns that he did not support the new government or the revolution, which just so happened to be 
an entirely accurate evaluation of his beliefs. This removal from the army would mean that he would be back in Finland when it declared its independence from Russia at the beginning of the Russian Civil War. One interesting fact is that while he would go on to be seen as a great, maybe the great Finnish statesman of the modern era, before returning to Finland after the First World War, he'd not really been that involved in local events, being busy with his service in the Imperial Army and in St. Petersburg. But after Finland declared its independence and worked at least in the same direction as the Russian whites against the Bolsheviks, Mannerheim would be put in command of Finnish forces. There may have been some concern that Mannerheim held monarchist views, which he did, and would continue to over the next several decades. But one thing that was never in doubt is that Mannerheim hated the Bolsheviks. And that's really what mattered for the whites and for the Finnish nationalists during the Civil War years. The only criteria you had to have to be a leader was that you hated the Bolsheviks, and Mannerheim certainly did. Eventually, Finland would earn its independence from the new Bolshevik government, much like its neighbors to the south. But even after the official fighting ended, there would still be some unfortunate events. After the war, over 80,000 Bolshevik supporters, including some women and children, were placed in concentration camps where almost 10,000 of them would die over the next several months, although many thousands would also be released during this time. Along with this, a white terror would spread throughout Finland with over 8,000 people being killed. Mannerheim would play a role in some of these events, while also overseeing the execution of thousands of Red Army prisoners during the war. These events, of course, did not happen in a vacuum, and were heavily influenced by the actions of the Reds themselves, with a Red Terror also occurring during the war. Civil wars are brutal, is about all I can really say to all of that. After the war, Mannerheim would participate in the first Finnish presidential election in July 1919, although he would be beaten by his opponent, Professor Carlo Stahlberg. For the long-term stability of Finland, this loss was actually probably really good, because Mannerheim strongly disliked the parliamentary democracy system that had been put in place, and he was a firm monarchist. Mannerheim also at the time supported the invasion of the Soviet Union <laughs> to kind of support the white cause, or other whites within the Soviet Union, so he probably would have gotten Finland involved in further conflict. During the interwar period, Mannerheim was then not really involved with Finnish politics, and he had a strong dislike of party politics in general. He would, however, accept the position of chairman of the Defense Council in 1931. During the events that will be covered in the rest of this episode, Mannerheim consistently advocated for negotiations with the Soviet Union, which might seem odd given his actions during the Finnish War of Independence. However, by 1939, Mannerheim strongly believed that the Finnish military was not capable of putting up meaningful resistance against the Soviet military forces. He still hated the Soviets. He always would. But from a military perspective, he saw little chance of success. Mannerheim and the rest of the Finnish government in October 1939 were so divergent in their views of conflict with the Soviet Union that Mannerheim was preparing to resign before the start of the Winter War caused him to be instead appointed as commander-in-chief of the Finnish army. Over the course of 1939, there would be several rounds of discussions between the Soviet Union and Finland, all of which revolved around, in some way, Soviet security. The initial discussions were based on Finland either handing over or at the very least providing long-term leases on some islands in the Gulf of Finland, which would allow the Soviets to better control the approaches towards Leningrad. The defensive importance of this control was obvious, but Finnish leaders were never very receptive to the idea of allowing the Soviet Union to in any way bolster its military strength near the Finnish border. On March 1939, this idea was brought up again, this time revolving around the specific island of Susari and a few smaller islands nearby, with the Soviets hoping to obtain a 30-year lease on these areas, in exchange for some areas on the Karelian Peninsula, which would be given to Finland. These areas of the Karelian Peninsula were disputed between the two nations, but were not greatly important either economically or militarily. But again, the Finns were not very receptive to the idea in general, even with the sweetener of trading some territory. The situation between the two nations would begin to change after the invasion of Poland. The quick destruction of Poland 
and the inaction of the Western democracies made it clear to everyone that the nations of Eastern Europe were on their own, a feeling that would fuel both the Soviet aggressive negotiations with the Baltic states, as well as the feeling of helplessness within those states that caused them to sign the treaties of mutual assistance. Soviet leaders hoped that similar agreements could be reached with Finland, and they would become more adamant after the other nations signed their own agreements in September and October 1939. The negotiations would once again begin after this between Finland and the Soviet Union, this time with an even more involved treaty with greater Soviet demands. Now the Soviet Union wanted not a few small islands here and there, but the entire Hanko Peninsula, which would be leased for 30 years with a Soviet naval base to be placed on it. Oh, and also they still wanted those islands, just to be clear, but also they wanted the peninsula. The idea is that this would finally completely solve the defense of Leningrad, because from the Hanko Peninsula, the Soviets could place shore artillery that would completely control the approaches to the entrance to the Gulf of Finland, and therefore Leningrad. In exchange, the areas of the Karelian Peninsula were still being offered in recompense, uh, but again, they were mostly worthless. Even though the Soviet demands were greater, and the position of Finland seemed much weaker, the Finnish government was still less inclined to take the New Deal, which was even worse than it had been before. This would be the final round of what could be considered even moderately reasonable negotiations between the two nations, with the next round being much less a series of negotiations and much more a presentation of a list of demands. This shift would begin on October 5th, after both Estonia and Latvia had signed their mutual assistance agreements. The Finnish government was notified that the Soviet Union wanted to invite a Finnish delegation to travel to Moscow for discussions. These discussions would continue throughout October and November, and the new Soviet demands were even larger than they had been over the previous months. On the Karelian Isthmus, the border would be moved west, giving more territory to the Soviet Union. The Finnish fortifications on the Isthmus would be destroyed, a series of islands would be given to the Soviet Union in the Gulf of Finland, and then the previously discussed lease on the Hanko Peninsula, with the Soviet naval base to be constructed, was still on the list. In exchange, all that the Soviet Union offered was some of the Karelian land that had been on the table since the beginning. Much like with the Baltic nations, these demands went far beyond just the specific concessions that were being discussed, because they combined to be not just a result in Finland losing some territory, but also losing its ability to defend itself against Soviet aggression. Those defenses on the Karelian Isthmus were what was preventing the Soviets from just marching on Finland tomorrow or the next day. And so having them destroyed was a major threat to Finnish independence and Finnish ability to defend themselves. And so once again, Finland would say no. for clothes at Plato's Closet in North Charleston in West Ashley. It's so easy. Recycle, earn cash, repeat. We pay cash on the spot for your trendy, gently used clothing, shoes, and accessories. At Plato's Closet, we buy all seasons, all day, every day. It's time to clean out your closet and cash in. Bring in your denim, graphic tees, athletic wear, shoes, handbags, and more. Sell your styles to Plato's Closet for cash. Then, do it again. Plato's Closet, located in West Ashley on Sam Rittenberg Boulevard and North Charleston on Rivers Avenue. During these negotiations, there were really two main viewpoints within Finland's government. The first was typified by Foreign Minister Erko, who believed that the Soviet leaders were just bluffing, that they were making major demands, but they were not in a position or willing to actually follow through if those demands were refused. The Soviets had not really been tested by the Baltic nations, who had not refused Soviet demands during their negotiations. And Erko believed that if Finland were to reject them, then the Soviets would be forced to back down. On the other side were men like Mannerheim, who held a far more negative view of Finland's position. Mannerheim instead believed that, at least before the final round of negotiations in October, when the demands really escalated, that Finland should have just given the Soviets the islands that they wanted in the Gulf of Finland. They actually weren't worth that much. 
Then later in the negotiations, Mannerheim would explain to leaders of the National Coalition Party that the reason he supported an understanding with the Soviet Union was because of the state of the Finnish military and his belief that the Soviets were able and willing to follow through to on their threats. He believed that the Red Army was stronger than other Finnish leaders were assuming and that the Finnish military was weaker than they were planning for. Mannerheim strongly believed that the Finnish military, while its soldiers did not lack in patriotism or willingness or bravery, was in every other major respect ill-prepared for a major conflict. But instead of these views swaying the official opinions of the Finnish government, it instead just caused many politicians to lose faith in Mannerheim as a military leader, believing perhaps that he was finally too old to be the leader of a resistance against the Soviet Union. The situation between Mannerheim and the other Finnish leaders reached a point where Mannerheim would tender his resignation on November 27th. This is one of those situations, in my opinion, where both sides were right in their own ways. The Winter War would show that the Finnish military was too weak to stand up to the Red Army, which was stronger than the Finnish leaders believed, and that the Soviet Union was very capable of following through on its threats. But equally, it seems very likely that any amount of acquiescence to to the Soviet leaders by the Finnish government, as Mannerheim was suggesting, would have been seen as, you know, just a signal of weakness to the Soviet leaders, which likely would have only escalated their demands further, especially if, if in one of those earlier rounds of demands they had kind of given in, because the demands for territory on the isthmus and the dismantling of the defenses entered into the conversation later, and they may have been brought forward to, to any conversations that the Finnish government sort of indicated they were willing to discuss on. There had been a concerted effort to improve the Finnish army in the years that preceded these negotiations. For example, anti-tank guns were being ordered from Sweden. But these investments were slow in paying off, a problem partially caused by so many other nations also frantically improving their military readiness, which made it more challenging to purchase weapons abroad. Another sort of input into the decision-making process of the Finnish leaders was the idea that if a war did start between their nation and the Soviet Union, they would get help from abroad. Closer to Finland, there were the other Scandinavian countries like Sweden or Norway, and then further west, there were Britain and France. The hopes in both of these groups would not end up being uh, sort of fulfilled. For the other Scandinavian nations, they did not feel comfortable officially entering into a war with the Soviet Union without larger nations also entering into the conflict, even if a Finnish victory was certainly in their own best interests. For Britain and France, well, they already had a war to worry about, but they did still discuss entering the war on Finland's side, even though it would have meant war with the Soviet Union. It is, of course, important to remember that these events were occurring before the German invasion of France, which would very clearly outline the military weakness of the two Western nations. But in late 1939, the assumption was, the assumption of the Finnish leaders, and also many leaders around the world, was that the combination of Britain and France were militarily very strong, and would be able to match up to even the combined power of Germany and the Soviet Union. Now, most of this episode has focused on the actions of the Finnish leaders, but we should also take a moment to discuss the thought process of the Soviet leaders during these negotiations. After their string of successes in the Baltic nations, the Soviet leaders once again believed that if they pushed on the Finnish leaders hard enough, they would eventually give in to what was being demanded, just as the other nations had already done. This viewpoint was confirmed by Khrushchev in later writings, where he stated that the fact that the Finns did not quickly give in to Soviet demands came as something of a shock, and in fact there had been very little serious planning on what to do if an invasion of Finland was required. But once it was clear that they would not give in to Soviet demands, things began to change very quickly. It started in the Soviet press, which would begin a sustained attack on Finland, blaming the Finnish government for all of the problems between the two nations. Along with this, the Red Army would begin to prepare for its next steps as well, which would be an attack across the border. One of the important parts of the Soviet views on Finland, which would impact decision-making during these early days, was the idea that there was an undercurrent of class antagonism within Finland that would cause serious challenges for the Finnish government if a war started with the Soviet Union. Stalin himself would believe that this was the case, 
that there were sort of workers within Finland that were just waiting for something to ignite them against the government. And if Stalin believed it, then that's kind of all it really took for it to have an impact on Soviet decision-making. All of these viewpoints kind of led into the important decisions, which would start the war. And these decisions would be taken throughout the evening of November 22nd, with Stalin and the Red Army General Staff in deep discussions well into the night. The general plan was for the Soviets to begin hostilities, while being very careful to structure their start in ways that they could plausibly blame Finland for what was happening. This blame was felt to be important for both international and internal reasons, and would be coupled with talking points given to local party leaders that would emphasize the provocation by the Finns, as well as their violent actions that that just forced a Soviet military response. But in reality, the first shots of the war would be fired by the Soviets on November 26th, when there would be seven artillery rounds fired so that they landed within Soviet territory near the town of Manila. The Soviet version of events would claim that this was Finnish artillery fire aimed at a Soviet position at precisely 3.45 p.m. on the 26th, and that the seven rounds that had been fired had caused the death of four soldiers and wounded nine more. This was followed by an angry letter from Foreign Minister Molotov to the Finnish government accusing the Finns of launching an attack on Soviet soldiers within Soviet territory. Then, later in the evening, the Finnish ambassador was summoned to the Kremlin to receive a note stating, quote, The Soviet government brings this to your attention and considers it necessary to emphasize the fact that during the negotiations, the Soviet government remarked upon the danger to which the concentration of numerous forces in the immediate neighborhood of the frontier close to Leningrad gives rise, End quote. It would then continue, quote, As is well known, attacks by units of the Finnish armed forces against Soviet forces continue not only in the Karelian Isthmus, but also at other points along the Soviet-Finnish frontier. The Soviet Union can no longer tolerate this situation, by reason of the situation which has arisen, for which the Finnish government alone bears responsibility. The Soviet government can no longer maintain normal relations with Finland, and is obliged to recall from Finland its political and economic representatives. There was just one problem. This was all a lie. Due to the risk of an incident occurring, the Finnish artillery had been pulled back from the Soviet border, specifically to avoid this possibility. And so when the artillery rounds started falling, there were literally no Finnish artillery pieces within range of the coordinates where the rounds hit. The Finnish ambassador would even later comment that it seemed clear that Molotov himself did not believe that what he was saying was the truth. But as always, the truth was of little importance, and the artillery was just the excuse that the Soviet government needed, and that they would use to start the war against Finland due to their rejection of the Soviet demands. The good news is that the war was going to be an easy steamroll. In fact, Zdanov, the head of Soviet propaganda, would even begin work with Dmitry Shashkatovich to compose a new musical piece to celebrate the Soviet victory with the demand that it had to be finished by December 2nd, just roughly a week in the future, so that it would not be too late. It would be titled, A Suite of Finnish Themes. The war with Finland was going to be so easy, no problem, over in a week, home by Christmas, and so it was important to start preparing for victory, and they needed a theme song for that victory. Unfortunately for Zdanov and the Soviet leaders, Those pesky Finns were about to throw a serious wrench in their plans, because all along the Soviet-Finnish border, the great and glorious Red Army was about to get a very rude awakening. 